Welcome to the Security on Cloud podcast, brought to you by Anishin, where cloud security and compliance are top of mind. Join the conversation with your hosts, John Vecchi and Scott Emo. Welcome, everybody. You're listening to the Security on Cloud podcast live on Anishin Radio. I'm your host, John Vecchi. And I'm Scott Emo. You know, we've been talking about security in the cloud on our podcast for over a year now. And folks who tune in to listen to us are for sure security advocates. I know that I'm always reminding my family not to click on that link in that email or don't click on that text from that guy or be hyper aware of phishing and other attacks. I'm pretty sure that they think I'm the most paranoid person on the planet. (laughs) Well, you know, like they say, Scott, in security, paranoia is a good thing. Or... At least a healthy dose of skepticism is always pretty good. Uh, so, you know, as we've said before, we all have to be on the lookout when it comes to cybersecurity, especially in the cloud. And doing that is often paired with what we call good security best practices. In fact, today's guest does that on a grand scale. So let's introduce him, everybody. He's a security advocate at Shellman, where he leads the firm's security best practices advocacy He develops and leads educational efforts on security practices, emerging threats, and security industry developments, both internal and external for audiences. He's spoken extensively on security-related matters. He's trained and mentored assessors. He's contributed to groups on emerging standards and advisory bodies. He has also acted as the CISO for Shellman and has an extensive history in PCI assessment services and software security frameworks. As far as the geek side, he has a long list of security related certifications, including Certified Information Systems Security Professional or CISSP. He's a PCI Qualified Security Assessor and Payment Application Assessor, just to name a few. Coming to us from Racine, Wisconsin, I'd like to welcome our guest, Jacob Insari. Welcome, Jacob. Thanks very much. Uh, It's great to be here today. Well, hey, uh, Jacob, before we get started, you know, could could you describe to our listeners you know, what a security advocate actually is and what security advocacy means to you? Sure. So what I do is is just kind of that I advocate for good security practices. I look at uh, emerging threats. I look at trends in security behaviors. I look at the needs of both our own organization and our clients. And I say, here are the kinds of security practices you should you should adopt. Uh, Sometimes that's uh, writing something uh, either for our clients or, you know, for our own uh, blog or other content that we publish. Uh, Sometimes it's putting together some training. Uh, Sometimes it's uh, providing some additional services to our existing audit work uh, when we're helping our clients Uh, to be able to say, hey, here are some big picture kinds of uh, threats or security matters that you need to look at, uh, you know, as a result of or as something we've discovered along the way of doing the the audit or the assessment work that we've done. Got it. And and I know you're with Shellman, and I've, I've you know I've got a question following up about your experience there. Can you just quickly before I talk a little bit about what you've done with Shellman, um, just tell our audience a little bit about Shellman if they don't know who Shellman is. Can just a little bit on to describe. Shellman's focus and and what what they do? Absolutely. So Shellman is a uh, global provider of independent audit and uh, assessment services. Uh, We're technically a a CPA firm, uh, but we don't do like the financial audit uh, or tax pieces. We do IT controls, right? So we do a lot of SOC 2. Uh We do ISO audits. We do FedRAMP. We do uh, a number of PCI services, uh, privacy, high trust, uh, things like that. So if there's a if there's a security or or IT controls audit, uh, that's our wheelhouse, right? Where we can be the independent, uh, authoritative expert and provide that audit service. Perfect. So that and that makes sense. So so with Shellman, you've acted as a CISO for some time there, right? Which yes. probably means you've got you know an interesting perspective from both sides of like as a CISO, as kind of an assessor. So can you give us an example of, you know, when those two points of view, a CISO and assessor, kind of the audit side, kind of helped you across, you know, the kind of advocacy and other things you're doing today? Sure. I think it, I think being able to sit on both sides of the table or having done so gives you a lot of empathy for the, the whole process. A lot of security audit types are, um, 
you know, the 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 overachiever, like smart kids in school who skipped all the steps in math and just wrote the answer at the end. Right. The uh, do things fast uh, kind of people. And a lot of security audits are designed or essentially have to be that way. Right. You're always playing catch up to your client. You have days to orient yourself and learn about a client's environment when they may have maybe have months or years to know what's going on in their environment. And so you have to move quickly, figure out what what happens in that client setup and make evaluations uh, to say, hey, this is where you meet these compliance requirements or this is where you don't. Right. This is where you're doing these security practices properly or this is where you're not. That's a fast moving kind of thing. And it shifts your perspective. It influences your perspective about how you look at these things when you play defense. Right. When you sit on the other side of the table you have to realize that every step you take moves in concert with a hundred other things in the business. Uh, you know, so a lot of security assessments maybe say, hey, your your third party security uh, onboarding practices, your vendor security review needs more stringency, right? You need to put more effort into the vendor security review. And you do. Absolutely, you do. Uh, but as the CISO, one of the things that I did was institute a lot of vendor security practices. Hey, before we just onboard a vendor and start hooking them up to all of our our cloud storage or our IAM or whatever else, we need to do some due diligence on them. And that had a very significant effect on the whole organization uh, where, you know, now it affects the timelines for how quickly we can respond to, you know, any number of things like, hey, we need this vendor uh, to do this marketing thing to deliver this thing to our clients. Uh, you know, and of course, you know, you're information security, so you get blamed for everything. Right. So, uh, (laughs) you know, the common refrain was, oh, you know, I I sent this vendor request to security and that's where it went to die. Right. And (laughs) I mean, the truth was I never rejected any of the vendors that anybody, you know, came to me with, but I asked them a lot of tough questions, um, and, and, you know, bit down until I got real answers. So, uh, you know, it did affect things. It does change things. And so that, That helps you understand, like, look, you need to have uh, the right mix of being sort of aggressive about your security practices and understanding where that costs you as an organization in terms of time, in terms of effort, in terms of how many other things it it touches. That matters. Yeah. And well, Jacob, you you mentioned in there, you know, uh, plain defense and uh, you mentioned, you know, uh, know, vendor security practices. So so can you give us an idea of what like what it means to promote good security practices, because I think that's why we're here. Right. right. It is. And I, th- I think what you do when you're when you're promoting good practices, when you're when you're doing advocacy or education, uh, you really want to take the, the practice or, or the understanding of the threat or the risk and think about how it is most appropriate to your audience. Right. A lot of security kind of hype is fear right is fud um and and i think you have to be very careful about that that's that's a dangerous sort of pitfall i mean one of the things that i think we've learned or or maybe we very specifically haven't learned after this many years of dealing with covid uh is that when you have this sort of amorphous kind of impossible to think about sort of threat uh people respond to that by just not dealing with it by pretending it's not there Uh, And so that happens with information security threats as well. When you say, you know, oh, your web applications are lousy with, uh, you know, insecure, outdated backend web components like Log4J or or vulnerable versions of Spring Boot or or Spring Framework or whatever, uh, and you need a massive re-engineering project to go deal with that, right? Like that's impossible to sort of comprehend if you're the product manager and you're trying to get features out by the deadline. Uh, and so you just don't deal with it, right? You just pretend it doesn't exist, right? La, 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 nobody's listening to Jacob. Um, Mm -hmm. and so instead, you know, if you're going to advocate for good security practices, you have to think about how you're going to take the threat and render it into something, you know, manageable and comprehensible. And, and that, you know, ultimately means uh, at the risk of using too many sort of buzzwords, actionable, Right. Here is a thing you need to do, right? Here is a thing that you can do, a thing that you can conceive of and act upon. Start there, right? And then there's the next thing, right? You know, it's just throw, hey, fix your log for J at people when they don't even know where it is, what it is, 
uh, how to get at it, how many things they have to sort of crack open to get at all of those vulnerable packages is, uh, you know, bewildering at best. Uh, but being able to say, here's how to start. And then here are the next couple of steps. That's, that's something you can work with. Yeah. And, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, rip from the headlines, right? Log4j. These are high profile vulnerabilities. You've got spring Force shell. You've got others. I think, as you said, you know, IT teams, especially, especially when we think of cloud environments, um, they're kind of hair on fire with some of these high profile vulnerabilities, right? So from an advocacy perspective, as you said, these are tough. I mean, how do you go actionably address these? Um, and so not just the couple two we just mentioned, but other threat vectors that are here in the future. Um, you know, do you have general advice on you know, how they just kind of deal with them or prepare for them or address them in, in general, in general is it's a tough one, but it, it, it is a tough one. I mean, I think, I think part of what you've got to do, I mean, I think if you're playing defense, right, if you're the security professional guarding your own organization, you have to shift your focus to categories of vulnerability and not maybe individual vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. right? Like the number of individual vulnerabilities will just drive you completely bonkers, right? And uh, and, and you end up playing that sort of uh, what Bruce Schneier calls the movie plot threat game, right? Where you're fixated on overly specific attack scenarios, which are individually sort of improbable. Um, yeah. and, and instead, you need to say, okay, what are the broad ranges of things that I have to contend with? And how do I address them? And part of that is, you know, doing the reading on what actual attacks are like. Uh, and so, you know, ripping the the log for J or, or spring shell from the headlines, uh, you, you know, that that renders down to a category of things like back end web components, right? Mm -hmm. Or software supply chain security, right? And and people throw around the software bill of materials or S bomb. Uh, and that's a that's a useful first step. I would say start there, right? Mm -hmm. Inventory your software components. Um, but that's just your map. Uh, that's, that's the array of things that make up your applications from there, start figuring out which of these are outdated, which of these are vulnerable, which of these are, um, uh, you know, maybe not currently under exploit. Although if there are some that fit that bill, you should start there, do that first. Uh, but then also be thinking like, Hey, I have this other component that's part of uh, you know, it's a Java toolkit or it's part of some Apache pa uh, package that I use or it's whatever the thing is. And it's old. I haven't updated it in a while. Um, you know, my development team tells me that if we, you know, updated this framework, they would potentially have to rewrite a whole bunch of functions. There are no current vulnerabilities. Maybe don't squeeze them to get it done next week. Right. But say, let's not play catch up when some mm. inevitable vulnerability arises and let's think about what your path is to sort of pay down this technical debt and get to the point where we don't, you know, where we can update this, right? I mean, not just, we can fix it once, but that we can have a regular pipeline of when we expect updates to this package or this set of components and what we need to do to be able to then apply that update and not break our application along the way. Which is really best pra part of best practices, right? I it mean, is. That is and like it essential, a yeah. ton of discipline and a ton of buy-in from people whose incentives are generally not aligned toward that. So, uh, it, you know, my hat's off to anyone who can sort of negotiate that solution because that's a, that's a really tricky scenario. Yeah. Yeah. And well, now uh, at the time of this, when we're recording this, there are some issues going on in uh, Ukraine. And so on kind of on the same thread, you know, are, you know, and maybe even, and it could be the same answer, you know, looking at categories of vulnerabilities, but, uh, you know, are there any threats or concerns around, you know, cyber around Ukraine and what you think, you know, we or, you know, our listeners should be looking at? Uh, I, I think so. I mean, I, I think, you know, what's, what's the saw we've been hearing for the last couple of years when people show you who they are, believe them. And so when you hear the the Putin government talk about you know retaliation for meddling in in what they're trying to do in Ukraine uh 
you should believe them. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think uh, organizations that are in, in other parts of the world, uh, you know, particularly maybe NATO countries that have attracted the ire of, of the Russian security services, uh, should be prepared for those kinds of attacks. Uh, you can look at the threat actors like um, APT-28, right, or Sandworm or Fancy Bear, or, you know, I, I lose mm -hmm. track of all of the names of each of the individual sort of identifiers for these sets of players uh but there i mean the sandworm shop you know is is very destructive right they're very mm -hmm. interested in sabotage and destruction unlike the the fancy bear types who are more about disinformation uh and and you know i think the attribution of a lot of like the wiper malware uh or attacks against like infrastructure entities are you know are attributed to them uh and while they can and do have access to sophisticated, you know, zero day exploits and the like, uh, they often make use of things that are well understood, right? Even the kind of not Petya or the, the prior, uh, you know, anti-Ukrainian kind of uh, malware that affected their energy sector uh, now almost 10 years ago uh -huh. uh, it was not the most like sophisticated stuff it wasn't like truly groundbreaking uh attacks uh and keeping aware of the basics right apply patches secure remote access things like that you know those are you know the drum that we've beaten until a hole is sort of ripped into the skin uh because they matter right keep doing that stuff keep thinking about how you're going to get your components up to date keep thinking about how you protect against insecure remote access mechanisms, right? Continue to iterate on that even, right? Get rid of SMS-based OTPs for your multi-factor authentication uh, in remote access because it's horrendously insecure uh, and almost worse than nothing just in the sense that it provides this false sense of security rather than, uh, you know, really mitigates against serious attackers. Um, but I think you have to kind of look at, at both ends of the spectrum, right? On one hand, you've got nation state intelligence services doing, you know, very persistent kinds of things, right? Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you've got a bunch of kind of dumb teenagers with private telegram channels who are still managing to like roll over sophisticated organizations with real security, uh, you know, practices and budgets, right? Uh, you know, I'm talking about the, the lapsus gang, right? Who... We all sort of sit there and look at it like you just downloaded PS exec and dropped it on the endpoint that you compromised or you just like bribed somebody with a bunch of Bitcoin to give you access to things. And the answer is like, yeah, they did. What are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I, th I think if you as an organization struggle to defend against somebody who just comes along and turns off your, your XDR agent on the compromised endpoint. And then suddenly you're blind. Uh, you know, you have to imagine that like the nation state intelligence service is, is uh, going to be a much harder sort of nut to crack. Right. They'll have a field day with, with <laughs> one surmise. You know? Yeah, right? exactly. And it, yeah. And, and again, as you mentioned, sometimes it's not so much about the sophistication. Some of the, the very unsophisticated attacks can be very successful. Um, right. Um, so it's, uh, it's an interesting landscape to say the least. And so one thing is that let's talk about specifically those organizations who are managing these environments in cloud environments, right? Um, any difference there? All of what we've been talking about is there, is it harder in the cloud? Is it different relative to the cloud? Are there other things that are maybe a little bit more important than others in the cloud or anything we should be thinking in terms of all of what we've talked about relative to, you know, a company just managing all of this in the cloud? Does that make sense? It does. I, I mean, I think, I think a lot of application layer stuff it, mm -hmm. it maybe has some similar qualities, right? Like whether you run your web app on-prem or in the cloud, the the app layer stuff has a lot of similar sort of security practices, right? You need to worry about secure coding and you need to worry about, you know, your software composition and your supply chain. Um, I think you don't have to scratch too far, you know, before you get to where the cloud services make a difference, right? If you're using, um, you know, serverless components or you're using database mm -hmm. as a service kinds of things, then, then some of the nature of that changes pretty quickly. 
Uh, I just read something this morning uh, over breakfast about uh, a vulnerability or a pair of vulnerabilities in, I think, the Azure uh, Postgres uh, as a service where some researchers discovered a series of vulnerabilities uh, that allowed for essentially a cross-tenancy access, right? There was a, a, a thing where like the regular expression used to parse the the certificate that y- that was used for authentication uh-huh. um had like a, a an improper sort of wildcard in it and so uh n- you know if you were uh a tenant with the you know azure like postgres uh as a service database uh you know in a common not universal sort of configuration but in a commonly used configuration Right. And anybody with a credit card can spin that up in, you know, less than an hour. Uh, you could conceivably then use the certificate that you have issued to you to get access to somebody else's tenancy, uh, which wow. is, you know, again, one of those like almost incomprehensibly scary. And what do you do about it sorts of things? And, you know, in this particular case, the security researcher reported it several months ago. It's been fixed. And so now this is the kind of responsible disclosure bit where we all find out about it. Um, and, and the the net result is you don't have to do anything. It's already been, like it was never at the tenant level. Uh-huh. And there's no tenant level fix you have to apply. Like we've already done it. And, you know, you're like, OK, good. But. What else is sort of lurking under the covers that I don't have any ability to to see think about, mitigate, you know, any of it, right? And I I think, you know, you have to contend with the reality that certain, you know, your cloud services have vulnerabilities and have outages. And yes, they have ostensibly dedicated security teams full of smart, well-intentioned people who work really hard. Um, But if you run something mission critical, right, or if you run... uh, really anything you've got to think about the category of vulnerability that my cloud service provider is adversely affected or my cloud service provider is down Uh Uh, you know we don't have to just throw stones at azure right like we can all count how many like aws outages in the last month or the last 12 months like affected real things on the internet uh, mm-hmm. And so if you're not as part of your BCP DR or your incident response sort of brainstorming and tabletop scenario planning, thinking about those situations, what do I do if my CSP is down or what do I do if a SaaS application that I rely on, like, I don't know, my IAM, um, mm-hmm. you know, goes down because of a cloud service outage, right, or goes down on their own, or like, what do I do if I can't get into all of my stuff because my IAM, you know, is, is taking a nap for a few hours. Uh, yeah. You, know, and you, you need to work. Yeah. On that. It's so true. And, and so what you've just outlined is you can just see on top of all your own environment, your application, your own infrastructure, all the things you're using, the CSP, the cloud provider itself, just the fact that you're in the cloud uh, in production there, that's, that's where your production environment is there are, on top of all the other things there are, all those other potential issues that you have to be thinking about, right? It's it's on top of it. And that's why we do this podcast. And again, for our audience who's in Azure, you just heard Jacob <laughs> talk about something pretty interesting. Um, you know, sometimes you have to be digging and finding this stuff because like you said, you're going to find out about it after the fact, perhaps they may have fixed it already, but you know, three months, four months, six months later, you find out about it, right? Um, and you have to kind of be on top. That's It's fascinating, yeah. Hey, so um, we, we've talked, uh, so Jacob, I'm going to switch gears here a little bit because we've talked about, you know, and we could go into this vulnerability and security practices and, you know, uh, the business planning, you know, that, that you that you just talked about, you know, contingency planning. Um, But you're also an, an experienced security assessor and QSA. Mm-hmm. And so we haven't really talked about that part of it. You know, you've spent years on that side of, you know, side of things, and we'd like to pick your brain a little bit on that. You know, are are there any new or interesting updates around the area of compliance? Because we've been we've been kind of focused on the the whole security and and vulnerability side of it. Um, and we've got a lot of our listeners that that focus on the compliance side. And so, 
Can you share with us any areas around like updates and compliance that you could share with us? You know, it could be, you know, anything that kind of, you know, is comes to mind. Sure. Well, so so I'll talk about uh, two kind of standards updates. Uh, one that I know very little about, and that's the the uh, ISO standard update, the ISO, I think, 27002. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and there are folks in my firm who know a lot about this and have spoken uh, eloquently and extensively about this. Uh, and I'm not one of them, so I'm, I'm going to avoid saying something dumb. Uh, but the standard that I do know quite a bit about is the new version of the PCI DSS version four, which just released uh, and has made a big splash. Uh, yep. And I got to be part of some of the feedback process uh, of that, that uh, a number of assessors got to participate in uh, where we saw some draft standards and we we made a lot of uh, proposals to the standard language and how it's reported and some of the new features, right, like the customized approach. Um, and, and so there's a lot of change in version four of PCI DSS. It's the mm-hmm. most significant change to that standard in, I want to say, eight years, right? So wow. like it, it's been building for a long time and now the mm-hmm. dam has kind of broken in terms of what's in the new version. Um, if you are subject to PCI DSS and you deal with that as a regular thing, you have a good window where both versions of the standard are active, right? In fact, today, right now, uh, assessors need to go through a separate 4.0 training piece in order to be able to do 4.0 assessment. So it's not like you can just go out and do it today, mm-hmm. and it would probably completely wrap you around the axle even if you did. Um, so you have time, uh, and you should probably continue on the track of assessing under the current version of the standard 3.2.1, uh, but you should probably start working with your assessor, right, mm-hmm. and and your compliance folks, and if you have ISAs on staff, definitely them, to say, what are the things we're going to need to do differently for version 4 of PCI DSS, right? Uh, version 4, like version 3, uh, you know, the, the iterations of version 3 over the last several years, contains some future dated requirements that are going to be best practices for some time and will sunrise over the next several years. So there are things that are, even when this, you know, version 3.2.1 of PCI DSS sort of dies and goes away and you have to use version 4, there are still several requirements that are future dated, that are best practices until some date in like 2025 or 2026. So you have Mm -hmm. time, uh, but many of the changes are significant and you should not squander it. Uh, yeah, I mean it it's it's a it it is like you said the the, the gap to 40 there are some things you got to be thinking about and you have time so for those in the audience dealing with PCI DSS uh it's good information you have time but um don't wait until that time runs out and you're trying to run around and uh fill some gaps that that could be you know substantial right significant yeah i mean if you if you check out of what you have to do for version four for the next 12 months you are going to be hurting 12 months hence uh so yeah get get going like have the conversation right you know talk to your assessor now even if mm-hmm. you're not particularly if you're not in the middle of your current pci dss work but even if you are say hey at the end of this we want to have a real conversation about version four right but if you're not pick up the phone and say hey we want to talk let's we want to hear your take. We want to hear what you think, you know, the lift is, you know, we want your sober opinion, knowing our environment, knowing, you know, particularly if you've worked with that assessor for some time to say, you know us, where do you think we're going to struggle? Right. Uh, and and be sort of honest with yourselves about what answer you hear and what you think you got to do to get from here to there. Yeah, no, no surprises. You know, that that's I, I think that's the uh, that that's what I'm hearing. You know, don't you, know, you don't want the surprises. Just ask. <laughs> ask now. You've got some time. Right. Well, and I mean, I guess, you know, again, as we kind of come toward the end here, Jacob, this is why you should, you know, view Shellman, your partner, as, as a trusted advisor as well. They're your auditor, but they're trusted advisors. <clears throat> we just talked about PCI. There's SOC 2. There's a lot happening with things like CMMC for the a for lot. the defense side. And, and you know, not, not to mention a lot of companies already meeting things like FedRAMP and we talked about ISO 27,000X and all that. There's so much, right? And uh, I think your 
you know, your assessor can be a very trusted advisor um, for companies. And I think that's one of the reasons we wanted to have you here as well, because you can just see the audience can see all that you bring and you need to take advantage of that for your advisor. They're your, a, a very, very critical partner. Would you agree in this whole process, given all the complexity and changes with Absolutely. multiple compliance? I mean, some companies are meeting three to four different compliance mandates at one time they, sometimes, right? They, they are. And many, many of our clients get multiple of the same. They have many different SOC 2s for different aspects of their business or different PCI mm -hmm. DSS. So we've got clients where we produce upwards of 50 reports a year uh, wow. for that entity, right, across, you know, three, four, five compliance frameworks. So it, it can get very complex very quickly. And if you want to have the experience where you work with your your audit team to minimize the number of times you have to go badger, right? Like the network security engineering folks about more or less the same topics, right? Like that doesn't happen organically and that doesn't happen, you know, with one side in a vacuum or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, it happens through careful, assiduous planning, you know, collaborating with the, you know, the, the audit team and the compliance management folks at the client to say, how do we organize this vast array of things in such a way that we can be the most efficient about it. Perfect. Well, you know, Jacob, this has been an awesome discussion and uh, thank you so much for joining us today. You know, if, if, if our listeners want to learn more, um, where, where can they look? Uh, I would send folks to our, our website, www.shellman, S-C-H-E-L-L-M-A-N.com. Uh, if you go to the the blog there, the the articles page, there are you know, a number of things that, that my colleagues and I have written uh, about a variety of compliance and information security topics. Uh, and, and there's a contact form there. You can get in touch with me or any of my colleagues, uh, about the, the services or, or just the security practices that you want to talk about. Got it. So if they, they can find you, right. If, uh, if some of our listeners might want to try to reach out to you, uh, you can do that. Um, and it's, it's just been fantastic to have you here and representing Shalman, a, a great company, um, so, uh, it's terrific. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Well, and remember the security on cloud podcast is brought to you by Anishin, the leading cloud security and compliance automation provider, delivering the fastest path to security and compliance in the cloud. And thanks again to our guest, Jacob and sorry, till we meet again, I'm John Becky, And I'm Scott Emo. See you next time on Anishin radio. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Security on Cloud podcast. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe so that you can join us again for another episode. And for tips, show notes, and more episodes, check us out at Anishan.com. See you next time.